I got a call from Bob saying the club was in, in desperate trouble, being relegated in the lowest points total ever, and he was really worried about the foundation. So he said, would I come and, and help him with the foundation? He, he was pretty remorseful and apologized over the way things had happened, which was very good of him. And I said, look, things are flying in Ireland. What are you doing with the club? And he said, uh, I'm trying to get a buyer. He said, it's, you know, it's been tough. I said, well, leave that to me as well. And that's when we put the Drumville group together and came and met him in Covent Garden in a hotel to discuss it all with the Drumville group and with loads of lawyers, etc. cetera. And um, before I knew it, I was, uh, I, was, I was in my first business moment of my life, I was um, about to be made chairman of Sunderland. And uh, that inst instilled a lot of um, hard work to come. But what was mo most prevailing was they, they had just let 90 people go from the staff and it was a really horrible time at the club. Worst points total ever to get relegated. Staff being made redundant. Um, 14 players, 14 professional players were left. Um, it, was, it was pretty low, pretty flat, but to me it was the opportunity of a lifetime. And uh, I remember going in, we didn't have enough players. So I said, who, who did we let go? Where have they gone? And you would Fella, you might have heard of him, Grant Ledbetter. Yeah. He was training with Hartlepool. And Hartlepool, had, had they offered him a contract yet? They went, no, bring him back. We'll give him another year. So I got, I got uh, Grant back. Uh, Bali's son and Kevin Richardson's son came back. They'd been released. I bought them. There was one other player came back. And at least then we had numbers. And, uh, and Grant took his chance, you know, to, by, with both hands. And he became a club legend afterwards. So, you know, the, the, that's, that's kind of where we were. We weren't allowed to sign players for money for the first few weeks. Scottish Bank, who were owed a lot of money, 22 million, I think, um, pulled out of the deal at the last minute. They didn't like what we were or who we were. So we had to find money overnight. And, and literally, we were playing Coventry first game of the season on the Friday when I should be training with the team. I was down in London with Anglo-Irish Bank trying to get money up to make sure the deal went ahead. Like, that's how tight it all was. And Anglo-Irish Bank, imagine, it was my first ever business gig. And Anglo-Irish Bank let me go up the train back up to Durham uh, with a... Um, a guarantee of the 22 million to pay to the Scottish Bank. So it was mad stuff in my life. You know, I hadn't been to business school. I hadn't, you know, I'd left school at 15, 16. So, but it, it started to work. And um, and obviously I struggled at the start, but uh, when Roy came and I was able to go off and do do, do my job and he, he did his, the belief came in the air. And uh, thanks to the guys in Drummerville, you know, we, we, we were able to get the club back into shape. and. Then it was a matter of getting it as, as as high up as we could over the next few years, but but it was a, it was a strange time. Did, did I spend my career thinking I was going to be chairman of a football club? No, it happened. It was a circumstance. Um, you know, I, I felt so let down by Bob that I ended up coming back to show Bob what he had done wrong. That was the way it was in my head. There was no other ulterior reason that would you know make sense. Um, but once, once I got in, I worked my socks off at it. And, uh, and I realized straight away that I had one big dressing room this time. I wasn't in a dressing room of, of individual players. I was in a dressing room of, of a couple of hundred, two, three hundred people. And that everybody had to, uh, had to come and bring their A game every day. How do they do that? How do we get the, the various parts of the business to structure and organize itself well? Just lead well. Give, them, give people their head. Mention everything there about the, the, the close unity within the club. Mm -hmm. um, and the way you you came in to understand it all and and to level with all the, the staff within the club is, is just amazing for all the Sunderland fans to hear. But mm -hmm. do you think that's almost sort of symbolic of what the club is? You know, that close unity, that yeah, do you know, sticking by each other. Exactly, and I hadn't thought about it for a long time. You know, I, I thought it was a huge help to everybody that, that the whole club, which was matched by the fans as well they believed again you know that that there was something good happening and then of course we we, we went on the run um to get promotion that time after christmas it was an amazing sort of uh amazing performance by the players to to get us back into the premier league and sometimes the thanks you get is you sign bigger players to get them out of the team like that's that's just the harsh reality of of, of life but for a moment it was really good and the first few years then back in the in the Premier League, you know, um, the Drumville guys sadly had to leave pretty quickly because of the, the crash in, in the, the world economy and um, you know, they were big players in their own businesses and suddenly, you know, the world had changed and they couldn't be seen to have a, a football club on the side. So we had to sell and Ellis Short came in. I was with Ellis for about five years, something like that. Um, and 
I kind of get a bit bemused at times because he comes in for a lot of criticism. I can only speak for the time that I was with him and uh, he wanted it as much as any as anybody else. You know, he, he believed in the way I was doing things. He let me do what I wanted to do. That I, He felt that I would be okay, that I knew the correct path. Um, he gave us money to buy players. Uh, he'd get a little bit wound up when we'd lose and stuff, but that's fine. You know, I just you know, had to deal with that. But, um, you know, I've heard a lot of... Uh, Bad stuff about him, ill feeling towards him, and um, mightn't please all the fans in the world here, but all I can tell you is that for me personally, he was, um, he was great for me personally, and was far more honourable, I think, in terms of the next steps, what we were trying to do. There was never a doubt that I'd be pulled and thrown under the carpet as I was a few years earlier at the club. So I always felt safer under Ellis Short, and... Um, Played out my time. I think at that stage when you've just quit and you go straight into a thing like that, six years as, as chairman of the club, or almost six years, um, given that we had brought it to a point where, where I felt, well, you know, I think it, it's ready for the next stage and, and Ellis was going to come in and he, he'd, he'd more time to give to it. And, uh, uh, you know, that, that was a, a time that I think all of us were in agreement it was the right thing. Um, I'm happy that the last game I was at, we beat Arsenal in the Cup. And I think got us into around about the quarterfinal or the fifth round, whatever that is. Um, I think we were in the top 10 in the league at the time. Um, Martin O'Neill was flying. I was delighted Martin had come in. Um, just I, I just find it hard looking back as to how Ellis and Martin didn't gel. And, and Martin could have been there for years to come. That's the way I thought it was going to happen. Um, but it didn't. So uh, have I regrets about that? Yeah, I think I wish I was around to have been between the two of them, maybe, um, looking back because uh, I think you, you had a meeting, a meeting of two great minds there that, were, that was probably clashing as opposed to, um, you know, sort of uh, someone in the middle to keep the, to keep the, the peace. I, I think that's probably, looking back, that's the one regret I have is that when I did leave, I wasn't there to support Martin or indeed to support Ellis to make sure he was happy with the way everything was going. And that, that, that began, I think, a, a demise that, that, that eventually, you know, despite hanging on for a little while, um, would 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 see the club go down two divisions, uh, wouldn't change a lot, but I think the one thing I would change. I've maybe gotten to the end of that season. Looking back, I left in February, I think um, February come March, and uh, even though it finished all right, um, thing was in good shape. Martin had done a great job, and it looked like you know going to sign a few players. Fletcher came, players like that, good players, good signings. Um, it, it just it, it didn't happen and then there was a succession of managers. But again, I can't really talk about that time because I wasn't there. As, as, as a chairman, I couldn't have had a better owner. During your time as chairman, you would have presided over many seasons that showcased a flurry of talent, exciting football, some amazing moments. Mm -hmm. Is there any player that particularly sticks out for you or is it just too many? Well, well I'll give the moments first. Um, I, was, I was in America about a couple of years ago, and I met uh, one of the Gillette family. And if you remember, Gillette family were involved with Liverpool. And I couldn't remember this, but astonishingly, he said, uh, you're the guy whose team scored a beach ball goal against us. <laughs> right? So I went, oh, Christ, yeah, that's us. And he went, uh, yeah, but I'm going to tell you something. He said, that was a low moment. That was, I was going, oh, no. He said, but said, you were really good. You come over to us and apologize and said it shouldn't have stood. And I went, did I? You know, you know? <laughs> I can't believe it. Well, I probably did, to be nice. Yeah. Anyway, that meant a lot to us. And um, we never forgot that because anybody else would have rubbed it in, you know. And, um, and it was funny, you know. It was funny, like, years later, something like that that could come back. So, so that was a, a, a pretty incredible moment um, to beat Liverpool at home because of a beach ball. Well, not because Darren Bent scored a great goal, in theory. Um, <laughs> The Carlos Edwards moment was a huge moment at the club. I think uh, I nearly jumped out of the director's box down on the crowd below me when it went in against Burnley. Amazing, uh, amazing moment for us to know that you know that was virtually it. You know we were we had sealed. We hadn't quite sealed it, but it would have been a miracle for it not to happen because of that goal. And we went down to Luton then shortly afterwards. And I remember Nyron Noseworthy dancing with a hat on and his bare chest and. It was lovely. It was a great time, and the do afterwards, then with the with the staff, where we all got together and see him hall, and um, the future was great at that point. And you know, it was it was an amazing time. But you know, there's some 
other moments there, you know, the, the, I can't go to an interview like this, soul searching interview, you know, without mentioning Liam Miller, without mentioning Martin Fulop, you know, um, two brilliant people who came and gave their all for our club and uh, sadly no longer with us. So there's there's a human side to all this that um, that's, that's sometimes difficult to, to look back. Louise Wanless, of course, um, as well. And you know, it, it's funny. I, I was I was away from the club when all those things happened. I'd finished. I was I was gone. But um, but when when the news came through and all, all of those bits of news came through, you you kind of you scratch your head and, and wonder what it's all about. You know, it was um, it was that kind of news. You know, to hear about their, their lives being taken so so early, so young. Brilliant people. You know. Dealing with Manchester United was very was very important for us, you know. I'm thinking of Barsley and Simpson in the early days, Johnny Evans, you know, um, really important to us. Two spells at the club, we had, um, if I look back now, uh, Kieran Richardson, like you know, Wes and John O'Shea came late in my in my time at Steve Bruce. Kieran Richardson, like that goal, he, you know, he, he scored against Newcastle, he remembered forever. But he, he for a lot more, Richo was a, was a lovely player, and I, I watch football today and I see Danny Welbeck scoring goals in the Premier League and I think well we had him when he was you know a, a young player but he was he was great so that connection with Manchester United was, was important to us at that time um, and believe it or not it wasn't Roy it was David Gill who we used to deal with all the time and David always looked after us because he knew we'd look after the United players who came and loaned there was Paul McShane there was, there was others you know and I probably left out one or two more but um, I do think you know that uh, a Man United player coming to a club like Sunderland at that time, just at that time, it was important because they were bringing this different, I suppose, mentality into our dressing room, which had been punctured and bruised for a few years. And uh, Roy, of course, leading all that. And so, you know, those were moments bringing those kind of players to the club. Uh, it was, it was, um, it was good. Uh, our sponsors in, in our first full year, uh, they were an Irish bookmaking firm, and they had to tell us by the last game of the season whether they were staying on for the next year. And um, the MD came up to me five minutes before the kickoff. Uh, I think we played Chelsea at home, did we, I think? And um, we had to do better than Newcastle, who were at Villa. And five minutes before the kickoff, he said, we won't be extending. We can't take the chance. We're bookmakers. We think the odds are against you. We think Newcastle are going to stay up. Okay, so when, when, imagine getting the, the feeling then when we did stay up yeah. and you're there with your sponsor going, you know, <laughs> I won't swear, but you know, you, know, you know what I mean. So there was some funny moments, so, some incredibly funny moments. It was kind of the good, the bad and the ugly at times, you know, if, when, when I look back. But the, the overarching um, memory I have is the spirit of the club when it's good, you can't beat it. And that's why, you know, the crowds and the numbers that are gone now, they feel good about what's happening. They feel that spirit and that culture is right. The, the reality of life as, as a football club owner, as a chairman, is not straightforward. Um, look, some make mistakes, some make obvious mistakes, but I think most, most try, as I was. I tried my hardest out. Was I the finished article? No. Um, was I too headstrong at times? Yes. You know, um, But I, I always got by because I had good people around me. I think that's that's probably one of the biggest things. When you fear in an organisation or you fear in a club because people aren't sure about what's above them, you know, um, you're never going to make progress. So, anyway, that's you know, I know, I suppose that's an, another little thought I have. Um, I understand how difficult it is, no doubt about that. And I suppose um, getting back in, you know, I had two or three offers over the years to go back, and um, and it wasn't that I was precious. It was more that. I kind of nailed my colours to the mast with Sunderland and I'd done it six years as a player, six years as chairman. Um, after the uh, Carlos Edwards goal, like my son, he's Sunderland daft now. I mean, he's true. He lives in Boston now. So I hear more from him about the club than I do over here and see more. He's, he's on the boards. He's on everything. You know, he, he, um, he loves it all. So it play, it, the club still plays a part, a big part in, in what we do. And, and, and again... I didn't take up, I had about three what I'd call proper offers to go in and, and take a club by the scruff of the neck. And I didn't do it because I just, I, I don't know what I'm saying, it would tarnish what I did at Sunderland, but it would certainly reduce that, that what I was saying to the people I actually meant. 
that I did care, that it was the club that, that got under my skin. And I just think that professionally, to just put that to one side and take some money to go and do something in another club where you're not quite like that in your mind wasn't the right thing to do. So I ended up doing TV for a while. And uh, I, I, of course, I changed a couple of things. Um, you know, I, I think there was uh, moments in games that you'd change, you know. Uh, I, I, I guess um, if I look back at the managers that, that I had, you know, delighted that Ricky came in after Roy had, had done well and then we sort of hit a trough. Ricky came in, got smiles on the faces, got us over the line. Um, should have been real comfortable, but uh, we, we kind of fell in a hole in the last few games. And he, he was actually delighted to, to move on having done what he did. And we, we, we were all, all glad for him. Steve Bruce, I thought, did great for us at times. And um, it was a hard decision to make. One of the hardest decisions to make. Uh, Ellis and myself uh, thought long and hard after the Wigan at home game. And, um, and we made a decision. Steve didn't speak to me for a couple of years, something like that. Uh, our wives stayed in touch, so, so we've kind of got back friendly again. But he did some great work with us uh, on limited budget. As he says himself, the club, in order to repay what had happened in the past and, and move it in, into a more stable financial position, we sold Darren and we sold Jordan and we sold Asamoah Jean. As Steve Bruce rightly points out, you know, they weren't replaced, certainly by the time he got the sack and he has a valid point. So I always feel a little bit bad about that, that I, with the football that's in me, I completely went on the numbers for that, for those three decisions. Um, and we sold some other players as well, and, and you know, we brought some good players into the club. We, we, I, I tell you, we brought some lovely players. Lorik Sana, what a lovely player he was, proper captain, proper leader. And when I look back on some of the signings, um, you know, I think people always point to the ones that don't work out. That's the first thing people do. But there was, uh, there was some nice shrewd bits of business done at times. You know, Katz was, was a, a signing. So we, we were talking about, you know, getting some strength and solidity into midfield. And um, I remember ringing Ellis and say, Steve has a lad at Wigan. He's a local lad near enough. He's from Middlesbrough. Um, he thinks he'll do a job for us. He's a grafter. He went, well, thank God for that. We have a grafter because we've not, you know, that's, you know, so I went, okay, Ellis. And we did a deal straight away, and, and Katz came, and he just had a presence about him, and he had a nastiness, but a, with a smile on his face, you know? And he could play, and it meant so much to him, and we thought people could rub off on him. But he played a hell of a amount of games for the club, and I think he, he was one of the best signings, even though it wasn't a glamorous signing at the time. Um, he, he, I remember, like, great ones come in, El Mohammed, fullback, uh, you know, uh, from Egypt. For buttons, we paid absolute buttons for him, and he just was as solid as you like, you know, bombing up and down that right side. These aren't the glamorous ones now. These are the ones I look back on and say uh, they were great. Was it uh, Sessignon, Stefan Sessignon? You know, wonderful player, tons and tons of ability. Maybe didn't quite get the best out of him, but at times he just he was breathtaking. But we 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 tried to put some good things together. Not all the signings worked out. Some were difficult players to to please, and um, were, were kind of a bit of a nuisance. Others gave you everything in the bag and in the locker, and that's, that's all you could ask for. You, I always felt, but Bobby Saxon, who I trust more than anybody in football, he'd never run a football club, but he did say, whatever you're doing in a football club, you know, you live or die by your recruitment. And I've never forgotten that, and I believe it to this day. Um, but we got there, and I think, I think it went nearly 10 years. I know I wasn't there for the last four or years or so, but, um, but it was a, a mark of progress or respect or stability, even though we were in the bottom half of the league most times. Um, Steve Bruce got us a top 10, which uh, I thought we were going to build on the foot, you know, when Martin came and then it, it just, it, it faded away. But, you know, all, all in all, it was a great privilege to, uh, to have anything to do with the club, you know, and to be the person that was given the responsibility to, uh, to bring it where it needed to be, to, to be the custodian, to be the guardian and to, um, and to ultimately lead. Because, you know, you can sit in the background and appoint people all over the place. But you've you got to get out and face the music when, when times are tough. Um, not get carried away when times are good. Keep the whole thing moving. It was, it was a huge, a huge time in my life, you know. I told you earlier, I, I was really fed up when I quit. I should have gone and played football somewhere else for 18 months, but I didn't. And my head was gone. Um, I had a tough time until I came back to Sunderland. And coming back to Sunderland in the chairman's capacity, first of all, the Drumble lads were brilliant to, to trust me and give me the, the nod to do it. Um, that showed amazing 
I suppose, trust and uh, belief. So that was that was important. And um, and then what I, what I learned and the staff that I worked with, and then even Ellis in the time after that, like Ellis Short let Niall Quinn be the chairman of the club. And any mistake that was made in my time was Niall Quinn's mistake, not, not Ellis Short's. Um, and I, and I, I felt, um, you know, in, in that time that I, I was, I, I started off life on enthusiasm and passion. But I, had, I was learning a lot more about the job as the four, four five, six years went on. Um, but I was obviously reaching a point of, hey, my family are back in Ireland. I'm never, my kids, I've missed their teenage years. They're going to college now. Um, I either go all in here or I, I take a break. And it, it's just so happened that I think the break has lasted um, 12 years, <laughs> something like that. But I get over once a year at least to see the, see the club, see them play. Embedded within all the stories that you've told, there's the high points, the low points, there's moments to celebrate, there's overcoming adversity and then to, to sort of finish off I just want to read a quote back to you and which football is often referred to as the beautiful game but in Sunderland it's a lot more than a thing of beauty it's a way of life yeah and that's something you must really yeah yeah and it was funny when I started watching uh, the Netflix series Sunderland Till I Die you know I loved the first one and the second one I got really uptight because they'd taken away Prokofiev and they were playing techno funk or something was the word they used. And went, oh my God, it's the very heart of the, the the message that we were trying to give to me when when we were in that tunnel and we used to get our young apprentices today in the tunnel, watch the faces of the other team, and this comes on and it was a big passionate play. And uh, when they took that away, I kind of got fed up with series two. Now I have to say, um, but then they brought it back and and uh, and you know the the song and the where the ships were made, you know, like for, for the credit music brings it all back, you know, and. Um, there's a special feeling about being connected to Sunderland. And whether I'm in airports around the world or I meet people and they come and talk, and they all say the same. It used to be, um, you know, the, 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 I suppose the stress, you know, um, it's, it's the hope I can't stand. I think that was a famous saying that came out about a Sunderland fan. It's the hope I can't stand, you know, that we actually hope we might do something. But then when it does happen, the whole thing just comes out and floods. And uh, and I miss that. I miss when, you know, when things go well. And occasionally my son will send me a clip of something that's on social media and I'll be on it and be all players jumping up and down. And uh, then it kind of comes straight back, you know. You know, he sends things through on the family WhatsApp about Sunderland and like Gillian and Ashling are going, like, <laughs> he's mad. But that's what it does to you, you know. And he was born up there and uh, he, he has... Um, a terrific loyalty to them so as we do as a family I think but he's he's the one with the, the flame highest at the moment but listen we'll, we'll be there the important games if they can stay in the hunt um, I think the best day I had ever with my son in my life was the Wickham playoff day we had a we had a ball and to see grandfather grandmother father mother child Teenagers, all coming together, like the spirit of Sunderland that was in the stadium that day, and to, to win the game, you know, the way they did, it was uh, it was great. Don't have too many days like that, so that was that was uh, that was a big highlight. Would I do it now? What was I thinking of? No, not in a million years. But there's something when you're a bit younger, and you know, you don't see danger signs, and you just see the right thing to do. And uh, you know, we we had a, a, a group of people working together, all believing in a common cause, all supporting each other. You didn't have the haves and the have-nots you know, made sure that players weren't stepping over their mark, that they were always courteous to our other people in the club. Um, that was a, a culture that we tried to bring in. We, we Look, it came in, and Roy was, was instrumental in that. And, um, and they were fun times, looking back, really fun times.